Last week, Jan Moody shared a fine message on who do you say I am? Who is Jesus to you? And she likened it to the old what's my line mystery guest. Who are you, Jesus? Who are you? And they're trying to guess who it is. Today, it's not so much who Jesus is, but what is he about? And what are we about in term, turn? Because Jesus knows quite well, as Sister Helen Prejean of Dead Man Walking used to say, to find out what I believe, I see what I do. And let's see what Jesus does, but even more importantly, what he asks us to do in the good news to come. But first of all, a brief reading from Exodus Those in the sanctuary cannot read that New Yorker cartoon Moses is saying to the burning bush, yeah, I could walk all the way to Egypt, or you could just free them yourself using magic. (laughs) So God is confronting a reluctant Moses and see what happens today in this story, which may be familiar to some. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. He's basically in exile here. Jethro was a priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. Moses looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Next slide. Then God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. The Lord said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. And I want you to remember these final words because we'll touch on it later when we talk about Emmett Till. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, to the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, to all The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And now the Matthew reading. We're going to go through verse 26 today. It's really all about following Jesus, just as Moses is learning to follow a call that he does not want to receive. So hear the good news from Matthew's gospel. From that time on, and this is after Jesus, uh, Peter has said, you are the Messiah, and Jesus says, you're the rock on which I'm going to build your church. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. That's must, not as a prerequisite, but a consequence of what he's doing. It's not necessary what's going to happen and undergo great suffering, but it is inevitable. And Jesus knows that. He must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, oh, I love this, get behind me, Satan. 
You are a stumbling block to me. Remember Peter was named the rock of the church. Now Matthew narratively turns it from rock to stumbling block. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, and here's a refrain we hear three times in Matthew's gospel, three times in Mark. Let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Elsewhere it says, sell what we have and give to the poor. But Jesus is zoning in on our cross versus here, his cross here. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? Hear what the Spirit is saying to us, the church. Would you pray with me? It's really not about him, is it? It's really about our response. It's really about the burning bush or lease the flickering fire in our souls. It's about our cross. Mm -hmm. Let us hear where that bush, that cross may be for us today and in our world. In Christ's name, amen. Located in the heart of Matthew's gospel, in the heart of today's gospel reading. Located in the heart here, we encounter one of the most profound and yet abused teachings of Jesus in our times. The teaching concerning self-denial. True self-denial. Self-denial grounded in two foundations. go come on there we go grounded in two foundations first of all grounded in the foundation of self in relation to Jesus and second self-denial is grounded in the foundation of self in relation to faith community we encounter these two foundations in Matthew's story today first we can truly deny self when it is founded in location location in relation to Jesus. Who we learned last week from Jan is uh, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now for what he does or is about to do, on the other hand, let's start with this curious scene that has unfolded in our scripture today. Jesus utters a rebuke we who are more liberal-minded might find difficult digesting. Jesus rebukes Peter, saying, get behind me, Satan. Talk about your come to Jesus meeting. This is it. But laying aside that S word for a moment, Satan, note that Jesus is emphasizing the imperative for Peter to get behind him and to follow him. In no way is Jesus judging Peter here. In the strongest possible terms, he's fetching him up for trying to control his ultimate self-denial and not Peter's own. Jesus' voluntary suffering, even a cross. God forbid it, Lord, Peter has insisted. This must never happen to you. T.S. Eliot might well have been speaking for Peter's wishes when he writes in Murder in the Cathedral, the last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. Peter's right deed, his wish to save Jesus' life, but the wrong reason, Peter, not Jesus, wanted it so. Or says it would be so. 
Hence Jesus' retort, get behind me, Satan. Don't deny who I am called to deny, and that is myself. As Howard Thurman once wrote, nothing is to be placed upon your altar unless it be a part of the fluid area of your consent. And this was Jesus' altar, his consent, that Peter is trying to mess with here. And when people try to mess with my consent or yours, sometimes we think, Satan, <laughs> just get behind me. And that is what Jesus is saying. He's not focusing on what he's calling Peter here so much as get behind me as in follow me with your own cross. For if any want to become my followers, he then says, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Their cross. Jesus says about each of ours. Now go back. Go back to the previous one, please. There we go. Then we go to number two. True self-denial is grounded in the foundation of self in relation to faith community. Their cross, Jesus says about each of ours, our one true unique calling of self grounded in the foundation of self in relation to Jesus, but here in a relation to faith community as the story continues. How Jesus calls for self-denial has been misunderstood in our society as just you and me, God, how Jesus and I feel about each other. It's so easy in the language of radical individualism to be caught in this spiritual windmill in the world. It's quite difficult, I've found, to understand that in the Jewish cosmology of Rebbe Jesus and his earliest followers, a sense of self could not could not be created apart from what is known as the body of Christ. So it's not simply their cross in relation to Jesus, but their cross in relation to faith community. Follow me in community, Jesus is saying. Not to be martyred, that's his deal and a call of a very few others in history. And not because someone else holds expectations of your life for you and would define you by those expectations. It's our cross in the midst of others. And the good news we find is this. The ground is always level at the foot of all our crosses. But we can only discover that when we stand at the foot of our own cross. There's no cross greater, truly, than others when it's supported in community. The ground is always level there. This is why Jesus says, take up their cross. It is a plural. There are times, of course, when external expectations of self-denial are so strong that they threaten to quench our spirit fire. We can go down in flames or we just burn out. The gentle guiding wind of the Spirit that controls the fire of the Spirit cannot be sensed. It happened to me in my 20s. Have you ever, ever feel like you burned out? No flame to guide you. You don't know what your cross is, and that cross is just too heavy anyway. Groping without a light. No authentic self to deny. Ever experience a dark night of the soul? Moses' plight today can speak to us here. For here we find Moses struggling to find what we would say his cross is. He's facing an identity crisis. In one respect, he's a native Hebrew burning with anger, groaning inwardly for the people and their slave labor plight. In another respect, he's an adopted upper-class Egyptian. Not enslaved, but free. Of course, he's running from the law here, but at least he's still got that advantage. To whom does he now belong? Moses. Where is his flame, his fire, his sense of authentic self? Moses is terribly conflicted. Like many I know, Moses finds his flame, his fire, his sense of self 
in community, beginning in an unlikely place, a desert exile. In a burning bush, calling him back to his peeps, his community, his blood relatives, the Hebrew people, to lead them to liberation. A fire that seems to take over the bush but will not consume it, will not burn it out or burn him out. A holy fire taking over that bush that calls Moses not to take over the world like Pharaoh, but to give himself over for the liberation of his community. Once again, the foundation of the grounding of the cross is found not just in relation to Jesus, but always in relation to community. Give over, deny a true sense of self, which we can only do in our community. A sense of true self arising out of community. It was this past week in 1955 that a black adolescent from Chicago disappeared in the tiny Delta town of Money, Mississippi. A 14-year-old who had temporarily lost his bearings, his urban and urbane sense of self in a summertime visit to what Langston Hughes once called the lazy laughing South with blood on its mouth and I who am black would love her but Emma Till could not love the South. For on a fateful August night, two white men he did not know would deny him the chance to both regain and grow into his sense of self once and for all. Till's crime, as we may know the story well, flirting with a white woman at the local country store, and we all know what happened. Abducted from his sleep, his lifeless body found days later. Emmett Till had little opportunity to grow into a self that he could deny for others. He was just an adolescent. His was a life extinguished. No burning bush here. No cross to bear there. Not for Emmett anyway. But tell Mamie Till Emmett's faithful and grieving mother back in Chicago that she did not have a sense of self to deny, a cross to bear. Tell her she did not have this. Tell, her, tell that to the preacher and sharecropper, Moses Wright, Emmett's great uncle in Mississippi, who witnessed the kidnapping of the youngster from his home. Tell him that he did not have a burning bush inside of his soul. Tell Mamie Till and tell That's preacher good. Moses Wright that they did not have a sense of self they were called to deny in community. Denial of self that presumed a strong sense of their faith community in the North and the South. In Mamie Till's case, the sense of self she denied on the behalf of her faith community and community as a whole was the privacy of her grief. Like Moses' burning bush of old, Ms. Till was seared by her grief, but she would not let it consume her. She would not allow her grief-stricken sense of self to crawl up into a closed casket with her mutilated son. Which is why Mamie Till opened Emmett's casket for all to see to her community, to 50,000 people in Chicago's south side who viewed the body, many fainting from the horrific sight. She opened it to a nationwide audience courtesy of graphic photos published by a black-owned magazine. For Mamie Till's grief did not take her over. Mamie Till's grief gave her over to those who needed to see the results of racism in the stark way in our country. Her simple rationale, I think everybody needed to know what happened to Emmett Till. The power of knowing, 
God to Moses today, indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians. Mamie Till, everybody needed to know what happened to Emmett. She needed to let them know in community. As for the Mississippi Moses, Emmett's great uncle, Moses Wright, he was warned by his abductors not to testify, or he would not live to see his 65th birthday. And yet, remarkably, he testified. The old preacher and sharecropper appeared in court in a case being covered nationwide. One reporter was the UPI's John Herbers, a native Mississippian and a longtime member of our congregation. In the docket, Moses Wright pulled his suspended self up to the height of his five foot three frame, pointed a weathered figure at the finger at the two abductors, and declared to the jury two words that, as a PBS documentary would put it, would go down in history as one of the bravest moments in the civil rights movement. Two telling words. Thar he. That's an actual picture of the moment right there. Five foot three. Moses Wright. <laughs> After the trial, when the two white men were quickly acquitted by an all white jury, Moses Wright escaped on a train to Chicago to rejoin his wife who had already fled there. He fled there to a new faith community, and he continued to be a preacher. Leaving behind their three-room house, their 1941 Ford and cotton blooming in the fields. Again, PBS, it may have been the first time when a black man stood in open court in the South, accused a white man of a crime, and lived. Preacher Moses lived just like his ancient namesake, testifying to criminal power. Thar he, Pharaoh, let my people go. Those who lose their life for my sake will find it, Jesus taught. Ask Moses, either one of them. Ask Mamie Till, all of whom discovered a new life from losing their old. Ask any faithful disciple who survives their dark night of the soul, discovers from the strength of a faith community a self aflame for God, and then discovers from a self aflame that there can be a self denial, but never a self consumed never a self like the bush burning out. Not in the context of a loving faith community anyway. This has been my experience, my repeated experience with church over the years. Self-denial grounded in a true sense of self, our own cross, has a home. That's what we let you get out of here. So I, I invite you today, you if you've that. not done so already, discover yourself from that okay. self -authentic, authentic self denial in the crucible of our up. congregations. For most of you, I'm simply preaching to the choir. But this is for those who may not have felt You're like they found a place to belong. A flame that will not take you and your life over, but it will allow you to give your life over that does not consume a spiritual journey beyond our wildest imaginings. Imagine that. A sense of self, a sense of self-denial. Thanks be to God. Amen. Just for my back some more. <laughs>